Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. I am Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. You know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the fascinating research being conducted by folks using the Hagley Library Historical Collections, especially folks who have received research funding support from the Hagley Center. One such scholar is joining me today. Aaron Van Nest is a PhD candidate at Harvard University, and we'll be discussing his dissertation project titled The Not-So-Inexhaustible Sea, Fisheries Science and Management, 1863 to Present. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Uh, let's start sort of with broad strokes. What is your dissertation project? So I'm looking broadly at the history of fisheries management and the science that is used to justify it. Um, and what I'm interested in particular is concept of sustainability. Uh, what I mean by fishery science is this applied science um, mm. that uses uh, tools from marine ecology, biology, population science, and applies them to making sure that the number of fish that are caught every year is a sustainable number. Mm -hmm. um, it's a science that is based around coming up with models and conditions that allow for management to set quotas and limits on fishermen, um, fishers to use certain gear for different amounts of time, and most recently, um, a certain number of and with the idea that they will be able to then keep catching that number of fish the next year and the next year and the next year. Uh, this is how things should work in the theory. What I argue in my dissertation in practice and what I'm sure many listeners have found if they've been um, paying attention to recent history of marine environment histories is that we haven't been doing such a great job of that. There are a lot of fisheries that are considered overfished there's a lot of marine ecosystems that are in trouble. Just mm -hmm. this week, mm -hmm. the IUCN Red List uh, added something like over half all shark species are now either like endangered or vulnerable. Um, so the science that we've been using um, may have some imperfections. And I have been exploring in my dissertation where that science came from and where those imperfections might have come from. Well, that's a really great um, nutshell version of the project. I wonder, um, what is the significance of the 1860s as the starting point of your chronology? So there's a long idea, old idea, that fisheries are inexhaustible. Mm. And that idea has been uh, promulgated very recently. Um, every it seems like every paper that I look at, no matter when it's in the past years, has said up until recently we have thought fisheries were inexhaustible, or up until mm. a generation ago mm. we have thought fisheries are inexhaustible. And that's people are saying that in 1905. They're saying that in 2000. So wow. the significance of the 1860s is that. Um, well, so in 1880, Thomas Henry Huxley, who many people might know as Darwin's bulldog, uh, famous evolutionist, um, was also the inspector of fisheries for, the Great, for Great Britain. Mm. And in 1880s, he was the first scientist to come out and say that they were inexhaustible and to give reasons for it um, based on some back of the envelope calculations, some conceptual um, understandings that he had about fish fertility versus the amount of catch uh, that seemed possible with technology at the time. And what I found in my dissertation, what others have found before me, this part isn't new, is that um, that announcement made in 1881 actually came from a survey that he had conducted in 1863 of fishermen. Um, where he went all over the United Kingdom and interviewed hundred and other fisheries inspectors um, in remote regions of Scotland and Northern Ireland, and 
asked them if they, in their experience, had seen fish declining. And interestingly, a lot of them said yes, that they had over their lifetime seen the amount of catch that they were getting go down. Mm. But then in the executive summary of this survey, he says that they're mistaken and that everything is fine. Mm. Um, and that there is no way that these sea fisheries are exhaustible. So that date, uh, is really the first I've noticed a scientist using the language of science to justify the concept of inexhaustibility, mm. um, which is why I start there. But Clearly, there are many people before that who are saying that the seas are inexhaustible. If you go back to the 17th century, there are debates between Hugo Grotius uh, in the Netherlands and William Wellwood um, mm -hmm. about whether the seas are inexhaustible. And they're using that to justify whether there should be freedom of the seas or whether nations right. should get to <laughs> have territorial waters. Um, so the, the debate is older, but this is the first time the language of science is being exhausted. Oh, that's fascinating. And then I, I suppose the debate must continue if folks continue um, to claim that this, um, um, the dawning realization of exhaustibility or unsustainability um, is continually being uh, rediscovered. So how does that debate continue up through the 20th century? So there's an interesting historiographical move that happens in, in the history literature where hmm. a number of people, Tim Smith is a very um, influential, wrote, not a historian actually, but wrote a very influential history of fishery science and says that that debate was settled around 1905. There's a famous experiment where um, this vessel is hired by the British Fishery Commission to do these trawling experiments and they show that um, over a period of 10 years that a, a closed area will uh, result in fewer or in more fish over time indicating that um, fishing is having some impact. I have found that that is a simplistic concept of the historiography to say that inexhaustibility dies in, at the end of these Garland experiments. Mm -hmm. um, I found that in part because many actors at the time questioned the validity of those experiments, mm -hmm. but also um, for a couple other reasons. One being that in the popular literature, the language of the inexhaustible sea continues well into the middle of the 20th century. There's a book published in the 1950s called mm. The Inexhaustible Sea. <laughs> that is uh, proposing that there is no functional limit on how many fish can be in the ocean. Um, what it will take is farming the sea. And that's not, they're not even proposing aquaculture. They're proposing um, adjusting the number of nutrients. They're proposing <laughs> um, these kind of basically what we would consider now geoengineering changes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example of the survival of inexhaustibility. Another that I argue is that what you start to see in the 1930s and 40s and is enshrined in the 1950s among scientists is this idea that sustainable fishing is possible and what sustainable fishing means under this definition is that you can catch the same number of fish every year mm -hmm. at a very high number. Mm -hmm. um, so the equation that is commonly cited, um, historian Carmel Finley wrote an excellent book about this recently called All the Fish in the Sea uh, in 2011 is, um, the the concept and then later the concept came first and then the equation <laughs> came later um, called maximum sustainable yield hmm. and what maximum sustainable yield says is that there's a curve um, for the rate at which fish reproduce um, and the x-axis of this curve is how many fish there are and the y-axis is their rate of reproduction. And there's a para parabolic curve. 
Um, so kind of like this. I don't know if you can see on my screen um, that says that if you reduce a fish population by, and it ends up changing, but generally at least 50%, often to 25% of its original unfished population, that is the fastest rate at which the population continue to grow. And it will keep growing at that rate forever and ever and ever. Uh. Um, this is a very appealing idea. It right. allows fisheries administrators to set a concrete tack, a total allowable catch, hmm. uh, which is necessary for management. And it says that that tack can then be, it can be adjusted, but it can also be kept the same. Um, this curve assumes that at no point there is going to be an LA effect, or there at no point is there going to be a low enough number that breeding becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it assumes that at any point, if you change the number of fish that you're catching, the population is going to adjust in this very predictable, very um quick and mm -hmm. <laughs> basically easy way so if you feel like you're if you are overfishing if you stop fishing then the population will recover easily mm. to maximum sustainable yield again it um, sounds like um the stable state theory of ecology is at work here exactly um it's a system it assumes that there isn't environmental fluctuations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, or if there are, that those environmental fluctuations do not affect um, fish populations and they'll return to a steady state, mm -hmm. uh, which is what early 20th century ecology in terrestrial zones also was saying, that there were steady state ecosystems and uh, climax states. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if there was a disturbance, then the environment would eventually return to that climax state. Um, with fish, what's curious is that there is significant evidence that Johann Hjort, who had found that uh, each year, the year class of fish uh, that survived the first larval state could vary by as much as 30 times. Wow. And what this means is that for herring, which is what he was looking at, um, the, the 1904 year class was most Have we lost you, Aaron? Um, just go, go ahead and pause our recording here. See if we can reestablish contact. Okay, we're back. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Apologies for that university Wi-Fi. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> so uh, the 1904 class of herring ended up dominating the population of herring for the next decade, and. Mm -hmm. What this means is it's certain very productive years that are disproportionately uh, enable a fish uh, stock to recover. Hmm. Um, and these fluctuations, as I said, have been known about since 1914. Um, they're not easily predictable. It hasn't substantial into fisheries oceanography to predict them. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing is there are a couple is in the mid 20th century that have been trying to do that. Um, uh, a couple scientists in Japan and a couple in California. Um, but for the most part, none of this made it into equations for finding maximum sustainable yield. Because once you start putting environmental variables into these equations, they become unsolvable. <laughs> so there are good mathematical reasons for not including them, but at the same time, what that means is that you are assuming a steady state ecosystem and you're fishing, assuming a steady state ecosystem, 
Mm -hmm. When that isn't an assumption that exists in the natural world. Yeah. Where does the 21st century uh, find us in this debate? So that's one of the things that I have found out at Hagley. Um, I don't know if you want me to go there. Yeah, that's but, a perfect entree. Um, starting in the 1990s, there was increasing concern that we were doing something wrong. The Grand Banks and Gulf of Maine cod stocks collapsed, and a lot of people were part of these generational fishing villages were put out of work, uh, sometimes permanently. And it became clear also during the 1990s that those stocks were not recovering the way that they should hmm. if uh, the assumptions in MSY held. So people started thinking that there must be other ways to do this. Maybe there, um, maybe there is essential fish habitat that is being damaged, and that's why um, the recovery isn't happening the way it should. Maybe we need to set aside marine protected areas uh, where there isn't fishing, and fish stocks can recover, and then maybe there would be a spillover effect in the places where there is fishing. Uh, maybe the types of being used are catching a lot of bycatch, a lot of fish that aren't targeted, and that's upsetting the ecosystem. Uh, be, because fish stock is being managed separately, um, there are ecosystem interactions. Maybe cod eat herring, and that becomes an issue. Uh, if you're managing one of them, they were in isolation as opposed to managing both stocks together. Mm. Um, don't quote me on cod eating herring. <laughs> um, for, for example. Right. Uh, but there are definitely these multi-trophic level interactions. Um, so what starts happening is that proposals to the way that we're managing fishing and maybe make it be more ecologically and environmentally informed. Mm. If those proposals happen uh, in the early 90s resulting in the Sustainable Fishery Act, which is to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is what governs all of US um, national fisheries. So mm. national seas as opposed to state sea fisheries. Uh, in this act, it's supposed to be enforcing um, essential fish habitat, which is something that's borrowed from the species. It's supposed to be putting limits on overfishing and setting recovery dates for mm. uh, overfished populations. And it becomes clear within a couple of years that it's a law that might look good on the books but isn't being used correctly. And maybe mm. it's necessary to add more legislation that would actually help get it enforced. Hmm. Um, so what I found when I was Hagley that I did not before is that there was a group of, uh, called the Marine Fish Conservation Network hmm. that consisted of both recreational and commercial fishing associations, mm -hmm. scientists, and environmental NGOs and foundations like the Pew Foundation. Uh, which are very influential in fishing. Um, and Pew, of course, has its papers at Hagley, which is how I was able to access these files. Um, Great. And it turned out that the Marine Fish Conservation Network had been very actively lobbying for a much stricter law similar to the Endangered Species Act, but for mm. all marine fish that would um, require essential fish habitat to actually be designated and marine protected areas to be enforced. Mm. Um, it would require bycatch to be defined differently in a way that would allow for investment and for fishermen to switch from bycatch heavy fishing methods to uh, lower bycatch methods. Mm. Um, it would have 
sorry, let me pull up my notes because I was just looking at this earlier. Um, uh, it would have changed the definition of overfishing and overfished to include jeopardizing the ecological integrity and sustainability of marine ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have had fishery management plans required to include ecosystem considerations. Uh, and then it would have not had the fishery management organizations. There are eight uh, throughout the US and they're often, um, the people who end up on them are political appointees who often are commercial fishermen. Mm -hmm. um, so it would have still had them have power, but it would have encouraged uh, non-industry representatives to be on those boards and mm -hmm. also given more power to the Secretary of Commerce mm -hmm. to accept or reject the fishery management plans that came out of those RFMOs. Mm -hmm. So it would have um, changed the federalization of fisheries. And this was not just a, a pipe dream. It was introduced to the House. Uh, there were dozens of representatives who were on board with it. It looked like it may have even been close to passing depending mm -hmm. on what happened with um, who was in Congress in 2000, 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have completely transformed the fisheries management world and probably how fish are caught and how um, fishers receive money. <laughs> it would have changed the organization of fishing. Mm -hmm. um, because the other thing that it does is it would have placed restrictions on something called catch shares. Um, now, I know this is, I'm introducing a lot of terms. Hope you stay with me here. <laughs> Cat shares are a tool that was hypothesized in the 70s. Um, there are some proposals even earlier by fisheries economists who would fish to start accumulating more rent on what they were catching, economic mm. rent. Um, what it would do is place uh, a total allowable catch on an entire stock and then divide that total allowable catch up and give a portion to individual fishers or fishing companies before the fish caught. So they would own fish before they're at, while they're still in the water. Uh, and then they would be able to trade these shares um, of the catch to each other. Hmm. And what this does both in theory and in practice is consolidate the total number of people fishing, consolidates the number of uh, because they, people who are less efficient, generally people who are poorer, um, who are subsistence, not subsistence for themselves, but like working class fishermen who aren't part of big commercial organizations, end up having to sell their shares and are, um, they acquire something, but end up being out of the fishing scene. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They no longer have the right to fish. And the right to fish is accumulating in the hands of um, smaller, more efficient, or larger, but a smaller number of more efficient organizations. Mm -hmm. um, this started being proposed in the US in the 1990s as an alternative to what was being offered by the Marine Fishery Conservation Network. Mm -hmm. um, it was pushed by a number of free market organizations. Um, think tanks. And it was also pushed by the Environmental Defense Fund, which is not a group that you would typically associate with like the Reason Institute or mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, CEI or these other Competitive Enterprise Institute or these other um, free market groups. Um, mm -hmm. PERC, the Property and Environment Research um, Coalition, um, was also a big player behind this. But EDF is also um, one of the main groups that is um, pushing for this. And they're actually asked to leave the Marine Conservation Network <laughs> mm -hmm. at, at this point in time because of this dispute over cat shares. Mm -hmm. And then what ends up happening, um, moving into the 2000s and 2010, uh, 2010s, is that the MFCN plan 
and Bill 2570 in the house uh, never passes. Mm -hmm. And this moratorium on cat shares that held for the 1990s expires. And then when the Obama administration comes in, Jane Lubchenco, who is a um, executive at EDF, a green scientist, uh, becomes the head of NOAA, the National Organization for Atmosphere, or yeah, Oceans and Atmosphere Administration, um, and starts implementing cat shares on a national mm. level. Mm. So they become the solution, the free market solution to overfishing. Mm -hmm. Um, and these other solutions, like looking ecologically, looking at multi-species interactions, um, using essential fish habitat, which is law, but has never been on the books in any enforceable way, uh, fall by the wayside. Mm. Um, and so there's this path not taken, and then there's the path that was taken, and that I feel like is the story of the past 30 years. Um, mm. and I don't know if it's the of, of inexhaustibility necessarily, but I think it is a story of faith in a single solution to allow um, continued catches without having to use mental fluctuations, without having to deal with the reality that we're not in a stable system. Mm -hmm. Without having to deal with climate change, <laughs> because now in a world where the the amount of fish in any given place is changing, even if the total amount of fish aren't. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to a historian in New London the other day, and she was saying, yeah, lobster moving north. Um, we used to have great lobster in Long Island Sound. In 20 years, we're going to be fishing blue crab there, um, which is yeah. wild. <laughs> like, his Maryland clock is going to be Connecticut, probably not as much in Maryland anymore. So, if you're a fisherman in Maryland and you have a quota of blue crab, that's going to be a problem for you because mm -hmm. uh, you're now owning something that will probably require you to move to <laughs> Connecticut in order to fish it. Um, and it's, not looking at these, um, the reality of environmental change is mm. going to lead to problems like that. Mm. Well, Erin, thank you so much for sharing your work. This has been really fascinating. Of course. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> well, that was, that was ideal. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and the Library, join us online at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>